I don't know what you know about meridians, but when I started off as a dental hygienist, I didn't know squat about a meridian. Matter of fact, I remember the first time somebody came in and they told me that they needed to have tooth number six taken out because their physician knew that it was related to their liver. And I kind of squinched up my, my nose and said, hold on a second, your tooth is related to your liver? It's connected by a string or what? I mean, I just had never heard of that before. This lady had hepatitis C. She had that root canal tooth taken out and she went into remission. Now she was non-responsive to interferon at that time. And so that caught my attention because that's not anything that you learn. At that time, I had already decided to go back to school and, and those that know me know that I'm a perpetual student. So if I could find a university that just let me live there, I, I'd stay there. One of my PhDs was, um, so one of my PhDs, my first one was on the odontons and the relationship to the body. Ooh, fancy words. Talking about the teeth and the relationship to different organs. And I found that there were all these charts that were out there, and we're going to talk about some of those today. And this is just one of them. So I thought that one was real colorful. So when we talk about a meridian, first off, I want to explain that there is a, a flow of energy along a pathway. And the pathway is what we're going to call the meridian. And the energy is what we call chi. I didn't make this stuff up. This is old stuff. There are a lot of cultures that recognize that, just not in the United States. You know, we think that we're so far beyond everybody and really come to find out there are some cultures who know things that we don't know that we could learn to benefit from. We do know that if your battery loses its charge, it's not going to go anywhere. As Americans, we recognize that because most Americans have a car. But the human body won't run if we don't have electricity going to it either. So when we talk about this vital force, there's not just one flow of energy. There's actually two forces, the yin and the yang. And the belief is that when there's a blockage of this energy, that's when disease sets in. And there are several different practices practitioners or different practices of the healing arts that believe in that principle. Did you just turn me louder? Well, okay, I guess that's even better. Such as acupuncture and acupressure and massage and yoga. I have people that ask me all the time, is there proof that acupuncture exists? Yes, there is proof. Dr. Kim Bon Han injected a radioisotope into an acupuncture point and then started taking images. And what he found is it did not go up an artery or a vein or a nerve. It went up the acupuncture meridian. Now remember, the meridian is a pathway. I took this slide because all of us in the IAOMT are very familiar with the smoking tooth. We have to explain to other dentists all the time that mercury coming off of the filling may be invisible, but it's not imaginary. It's the same thing when you're talking about the meridians and the flow of energy. It's not imaginary. Americans think it's imaginary. You know, over in Asia, when Nixon went over to China and had acupuncture, it became very popular here because the president did it. So it must be true. It's crazy at the time. But if the energy is flowing through these pathways, what happens when there's a blockage? So I'm going to, I like to speak in word pictures so that I give you concepts of things because when I'm talking to my patients, especially when I'm talking about some of the things that I talk about and I'm using big words like methylation, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So I have to put it in some kind of a word picture. So I know all of you guys have seen Indiana Jones. Do you remember when he's walking in and there's those invisible lines that when somebody walks through, there's like a little laser and it trips and the, it, the arrows go through? Well, 
obviously they knew exactly what was going to happen when you tripped that invisible light. Certain arrows would come through. It was a predetermined pathway. It's similar to that. These pathways are flowing. I remember the craziest thing that I ever heard was I was teaching some dentists and some physicians together in a group and we were talking about meridians and the one physician raised his hand and he said look I do an awful lot of autopsies and I have never seen a meridian I said great I tell you what the moment you can do an EKG on your corpse I can show you a meridian well, I can't do an EKG. They're, they don't have any electricity going through them. I said, that's exactly why I can't show you a meridian at the moment that they're a corpse. So this energy can be blocked at either end. It could be a tooth that's a problem, or it could be an organ. So for me, it was really interesting when I was doing my PhD, working on this relationship of the teeth to the rest of the body and vice versa, I would look at a panorex, and I would see that the mesial of the six-year molars on the mandible had fillings, but the distal of the bicuspids didn't. Why was that? The same amount of plaque was in between those teeth. How come those bicuspids didn't decay? Why did only the molars decay? And so I started asking questions, and I would find out that the person, usually as a child that I was working with at that time, when I'd ask them about their bowel habits, they said, oh yeah, he's regular, like clockwork, once a week. Okay, that, that might be regular for him, but that is not healthy and it's not normal. But the blockage of energy was then at the large intestine, which meant that not enough energy was going to that tooth, which is why it couldn't fight off the same amount of acids that the bicuspid was incurring. Do you understand how this goes? So you're going to think of a circuit. Now, in my home, if my dishwasher and my disposal don't work in the kitchen, but my oven and my stove both work, I'm going to wonder what's going on. Maybe a breaker tripped. I don't know a lot about electricity, so I'm going to go out to my garage, which is where my breaker box is, and I notice that it hasn't tripped. So I don't know anything more about electricity. I'm going to have to call an electrician who comes out with an ohm meter and starts sticking it in different outlets and tells me that a little mouse has nibbled a hole in the wiring, and therefore the electricity can't go any further than where it's going. It stops at this point. So for just a moment, I want you to envision a lamp, and I plug it in. I plug it in right here, and I turn on the switch. Light bulb turns on. I know I have power coming to the building, going to the outlet, going up the wire, and I have a good bulb. Now I'm going to unplug it from the wall and I'm going to get an X-Acto knife and I'm going to trim open the cord and I'm going to peel it back and I'm going to cut out an inch of the wiring. Do you understand why when I plug that back into the wall, the light bulb will not turn on? Because the electricity cannot jump the gap where there is no wiring. That's a meridian with a blockage in it. And we're going to talk about that a couple of times, but i like for you to have that visual image. Think of the freeway here as the meridian. So we've got traffic that's going on there, and as long as we don't have any traffic jams, that's what we would like it to be flowing in our body, just like that. But in Texas, every once in a while, we've got some cattle that get in the way. That becomes a blockage of energy. Or we end up with some trees down, maybe like Hurricane Harvey when it came through. And even though those cows and the trees aren't permanent and they can be moved, at this moment it's a burden. So sometimes we have burdens in our body that are temporary and we can deal with it and fix it and then the energy flows through in that area. Sometimes we have things that are dangerous to remove, like a power line that is down on my road right here. But this is one of the best examples that I like to use. This was Houston during Storm uh, uh, Allison that we had that came through. And I was able to capture this, and this is one of the best analogies that I can think of to explain how the road, again, we're still using that as our meridian. Do you see how the water is over the road? 
So right now, that road is not usable. If I'm a car and I'm right here, I can't get to the other side because of the water. Now, if I had a magical helicopter with a big old vacuum cleaner and I could just suck that water right off of there, the moment that the water is off of that freeway, I could use it immediately. That's the way it is with the meridian. So when we take out a tooth that is a blockage, it's been deemed a blockage, and we'll talk about that as well, and we remove all of the dead bone, the energy can go through there immediately. Let's use another analogy. You have Christmas lights in your hand, and I have an extension cord plugged in ready to connect to you, because you want to know if all the Christmas lights light up. But we have a door that has been slid between us, like those little doors, that sliding doors. We can't connect because of that door. So my husband comes along with some sandpaper and starts sanding the door. How much of the door will he have to remove before we can connect? All of it. Can't just be a little bit. It's got to be all of it. Remember the lamp that we plugged in just a little while ago, but now we took out part of the wire? How much of that gap do I have to remove? How close do the wires have to come before the lamp light will turn back on? All of it. That's splicing the wire back together. When you remove a tooth and all of the dead bone, instantly it reconnects and it's measurable. We're going to talk about that too. There are some things that create blockages that are iatrogenic and some that aren't. Of course, a root canal or a cavitation and sometimes implants, which we're going to talk about. When we use a titanium implant, now, I look at a patient and I look at their blood work, I look at which teeth the meridian is connected to in an area where they want to have an implant, and then we have a discussion about whether their body is healthy enough to even withstand having an implant. I have them do testing like compatibility. So I, I do want you to know that all titanium implants have nickel in them. If you don't believe me, you can talk to me and I will give you some information on that. But that's an issue for people who have a, a reaction to nickel. Metal can also cause a problem. If you stick a fork in an electric socket, and you bend it around and you stick it in the bottom, do you understand how you'll short out that circuit? That can happen in a body as well, and it's measurable. So unfortunately, you don't know until I, you've actually placed the implant. It's kind of a bummer to say, oh, well, that's not going to work. Let's take it out. So when we talk about uh, an implant, it's not just the metal. Let's say we use a zirconia, which zirconia is a metal, but it's a porcelain. You guys ever seen the gadget that you can put on your lamp, and then you touch your lamp, and you don't have to reach for the switch for the light to come on? Do you know what I'm talking about? You must put that little gadget on a metal part of the lamp. You can't put it on the porcelain part. And then you have to touch a metal part of the lamp in order to get it to con conduct the electricity from you to turn it on and off. If you put it on the porcelain, it's not going to work at all. Why? Because porcelain is non-conductive. So let's get back to our lamp where we have the gap in the wiring. If I told you that earlier hiring an electrician and splicing the wire back together makes the lamp work, but I don't want to splice it back together. I want to put something artificial in between there. Let's put a porcelain straw in between there, like a soda straw. I've got my lamp. I plug it in. It doesn't work. Do you understand why? Because the porcelain is non-conductive. So I heard last night someone say, well, if we put a porcelain implant in there and then you chew on it, it stimulates the meridian. Okay, here's my cord on the floor. Now I'm going to jump up and down on this porcelain in between the wire. Is that going to make the lamp come on? No, not at all. When we're talking about the measuring that I, I suggested earlier, there are some people who choose to do it through applied kinesiology. I choose to do it through EAV. There, there is equipment out there 
that allows you to measure body's response, which is bioenergetic devices. We use them all the time in things like EKGs and EEGs and EMGs because every process begins with energy. I, I need to stomp my foot there, which means that's something important that you need to remember. If I cut my finger, I'm going to have an exchange of energy that's almost instantaneously going to my brain to tell me that I cut my finger and I need to move my finger back. But then I'm also going to have an exchange of en energy that starts chemistry going for the clotting cascade to start. And all of this happens so fast, but the energy is what starts it. When we talk about either a dental focus or a dental foci, I need for you guys to understand that a lot of times those are what we call cavitations, where we have an area that's surrounded by lymphocytes and basically it creates a black hole. So my energy tries to go through and we're, we're back on our freeway. I have that blockage of water. And so it, the energy just disperses. It can't go through to the other side. And so if we're talking about our measuring devices, we're able to see that there's a blockage there. Uh, sometimes, just of interest, you'll find an area in a third molar and the person will tell you that they never had a wisdom tooth. No, they usually have never had enough energy from the get-go to be able to nurture the bud so it died on the vine. Now we get to those charts. Oh my gosh, there are so many different charts that were out there. So when I was working on my thesis, I had to look through all of these and then try to coordinate to see if they were all jiving with each other. I found a lot of interesting information, found some that were connected to muscles. Um, there were physicians that had some. There were some out there for dentists. There were some out there for chiropractors relating all different parts of the body. Am I still not loud enough? Okay, good. Oh, wow, that really helped. Some of these charts were really old and, and left a lot to the imagination. I'm, the next one is the most interesting. When I was trying to commit all of this to memory, I would always start with tooth number one. It's a wisdom tooth. It relates with the wisdom tooth on the bottom, so that was pretty easy. But then when I would get to the molars on top and try to have them be the same as the molars on the bottom, I was all screwed up. And it didn't matter how many times I tried to commit this to memory, I would get confused. I was working with the Chinese acupuncturist, Dr. Kang, who told me, you know, it makes a crisscross on the face, but I, I couldn't understand his English. So I, I wrote down in kind of my own hieroglyphic what he said, and it wasn't until I found this chart that I went, oh my gosh, I, I completely understand what he's saying now. The molars on the maxilla relate to the bicuspids on the mandible, and the bicuspids on top relate to the molars on the mandible. And it, it wasn't really until I saw this. But again, I'm a real visual person, so that's why it, it helped to make that connection. Then as I found this chart, and this is a really old one from the Academy of Biological Dentistry, this is where I started to notice that there were flaws in some of the charts. They simply needed to flip this to make it correct. But as it is, it's wrong. And if you look at this, it's got a pancreas on the left side. And in acupuncture, the pancreas is not on the left side. This is the spleen. And so I just started making my own chart, really for my own benefit, to be able to memorize it. And I came up with this. And so I'm just going to pass it around so you all can see a, a, an up-close version of it. The, we're going to go over all the, the teeth. but. In the center, those teeth on the maxilla and the mandible really have to do with the uh, genital urinary tract. And so for me, the way to remember those teeth, had they're related to urine, was to make it yellow. The, there is just no other rationale for the rest of the colors there. I just picked the yellow and started from there. And then I saw pictures like this where I went, oh, okay, now I'm starting to see some of the crisscrosses on the face so it doesn't go on a straight line. 
I do want to tell you that there, this is not new information. There's information out there that says there's a 4,000-year-old papyrus that is describing how a pharaoh is having problems with arthritis, and his doctor is trying to explain to him it's teeth that are bad and they need to come out. Really, that's a long time ago. Then we've got this Edwin Smith papyrus. It's the oldest known uh, surgical treatise that's out there on trauma, and it was written before 3000 BC, and it gives instructions on how to treat and heal wounds of the mouth. You know, I remember when I first got into dentistry, which would have been in 1976, and I had questions about whether people were coming in with heart disease, if that was any, anything related to the amount of tartar that was building up on their teeth. And then I thought, well, I must be bizarre to think about things like that. But you know, we are now linking cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease. So, it, and we're thinking it's new. And hair has been around for a really long time. This is how I feel now. When I look in somebody's mouth, I'm going, oh, your heart and your lungs look good too. I'm, and I'm looking at their teeth, but you'll be able to do that as well. If we look at tooth number one and 16, 17 and 32, those are all the wisdom teeth. If you look at the chart on here, they're related to more than what I'm going over, but the main organs are the small intestine and the heart. And so if you have someone who comes in and they have an irregular heartbeat of unknown etiology and nothing prescription-wise is helping it, then you start thinking about maybe a cavitation in that area. And I'll give you a hint, on the bottom, a lot of people have chronic fatigue and they have a cavitation on one of those wisdom teeth sites. Then we start looking at the maxillary molars and the mandibular bicuspids. And these teeth, this is where we have that crisscross, so don't freak out. But energetically, they're related to the stomach and the breast. Now there's an extra tooth that's related to the breast, the second bicuspid on both sides on the top. If you guys watch the movie Root Cause, I'd like to make a slight disclaimer here. I was quoted as saying that 98% of all women who have breast cancer have a tooth related to that breast treated with a root canal. If you actually heard the entirety of what I said, I said, in Dr. Rao's clinic, of the women he is working with, 98% of the women had a root canal on the same side as their offending cancer. So it was slightly taken out of context, but I will tell you that my own research, because I do thermography and I do EAV, and I pretty much stick with teeth. That's what I do all day long. And there's a very tight connection with all kinds of degenerative diseases and the dental foci. We keep going and we've got our bicuspids on top and our molars on the bottom and they're really related to the lung and large intestine. But there's a little clue here that the mandibular molars are also related to the artery and vein. So if someone comes in and maybe they have hypertension that they've never had before, you wanna look at, did, did you just put a crown on one of those lower molars? Was it a metal crown? And then we have the cuspids and everybody knows these as the eye teeth. And they are, they're the eye teeth. They're related to the eye, the liver, and the gallbladder. And then we have all those anterior teeth, top and bottom. Interesting story, as I was doing my research, I had a pile yay high, not really this high, but it was much higher than the rest, that was men who had elevated PSAs and they either had a missing tooth where maybe a football injury it got knocked out or they had a root canal tooth or they had a dead tooth where it had had some kind of trauma and energy couldn't go through it at all. And my husband said, why is that pile bigger than the others? And I said, I don't know, it's, it's men who are having problems with their prostate. And in, in particular, a lot of them have prostate cancer. Now my husband at the time, he was a paramedic, but he was going through seminary at that particular time. We went to a Christmas party afterwards and someone came up to him and said, oh, Toby, my dad just found out that he has prostate cancer. And instead of saying, oh, let's pray for him, my husband said, oh my gosh, Don is gonna wanna know if he has a root canal in one of his four front teeth, <laughs> top or bottom. So I created a monster. <laughs> 
Okay, so we talk about the, the meridians and how dentistry can be involved. Now, I already told you earlier, you can have an organ that is so dysfunctional that it causes problems for a tooth. Here's an example. Women who wear a bra that is too tight completely chokes off the lymphatics, and it's not uncommon for the teeth that are related to the breast then to die. For no known reason, it's not like they get major decay, but all of a sudden the tooth abscesses. It can work the other way as well. So the root canals, for me, everybody focuses on the bacteria. Yes, the bacteria is an issue. You can fill it with whatever you want. I don't care. You can nuke it. You can laser it. You can ozonate it and worry about the bacteria all you want. Let's get back to our lamp. Remember that lamp where I took out part of the wire? I really don't care if the wire where it's missing now is sterile, or if a little dog comes along and poops right on top of it. I don't care. It's not going to light up because the wire is not touching. Dead is dead. And unfortunately, a root canal tooth, no matter what you try to do to it, is still a dead organ there. A lot of dentists don't pay attention to their patient's lab work. And I'm going to encourage you, if you have a patient that has a root canal, number one, take an x-ray of the apex of that tooth every year when you take bite wings and monitor it. Number two, ask that person to have a hemoglobin A1C. Cannot tell you how many times people have come in where they've been labeled as diabetic, and it's because they're living with a chronic low-grade infection that they don't even know is there. And then when they have the tooth taken out, they wait three and a half to four months, get another hemoglobin A1C, and aha, their hemoglobin A1C went from 12 to 5.6. Well, they were not diabetic. It's just that their pancreas could not deal with that um, amount of infection that they had. So when we talk about the implants, for me, again, it's an electrical problem, whether you're scooting too much electricity through and shorting out the meridian, or whether you're placing porcelain in and you're inhibiting the amount of electricity going through there. I'm not anti-implant, so don't take me wrong and jump to conclusion. I don't like titanium. I'm, I'm pretty clear on that. But if somebody's going to have four implants placed on the mandibular molars, I want you to understand that you are now blocking 50% of the energetic pathway to the lung and large intestine. So I'd like to be picky about where those implants go and not burden the person by shutting down those pathways. And then the thing I want you to know is ab there's nothing is good. We don't have anything that replaces good enamel. As far as I'm concerned, we really need to be working on prevention more than we need to be doing some of the other things that we're doing because there's nothing as good as what God gave us. I'm going to encourage you to do what I did, which is to be a skeptic, to be the doubting Thomas, to sit there and go, yeah, this is absolute BS. This is just not so. I want you to start looking at where people have missing teeth, where they have root canals, and look at the dental chart and just start going backwards and looking at some of their health history. At some point, you'll be able to do what I do now which is when I hear their health history, I'm going, do you have a root canal on such and such? Do you have a root canal over there? <laughs> and they'll go, oh my God, yes, I do. How did you know that? Okay, well, I guess it's just a guess. I would love for you to think teeth when you're thinking health, and this is the same thing for physicians. A lot of physicians don't realize how important the teeth are and how there needs to be a network, a team effort. It takes a dentist and a physician in order to work on the patient. And so it really does take a team. If you've got questions or anything else, I'm going to encourage you to email me. Um, we have just a couple more minutes here, so I wanted to run through a couple of cases. Plus, in your PowerPoint that you have access to on the app, I put some things on here because I know some people like, where did she come up with this crap? There's lots of information out there, and it's not just from our country. Uh, of course, originally, Vole was the one who came up with the piece of equipment that I use now uh, in the EAV. 
This was Denise. She had pain that started on the lower jaw that radiated down her neck so bad that she had to go to the ER, and they told her it was a tooth. Kudos to them that they even figured that out. I was surprised. So she went to see a dentist who told her that she needed a root canal on tooth number 30. She was referred to an endodontist who said, yep, that's, that's exactly what needs to happen. But something inside told her, maybe I need a second opinion. So she went to see a biological dentist who said, stop, let's get more information. So she was sent to me. I took a Panorex on her and I didn't see anything. So I wasn't really sure what to do. Nothing shows up on the x-ray at all. So I'm gonna remind you that you always remember that there's an exchange of energy before the chemistry happens. So I used EAV. I went through and did some testing on her. The piece of equipment that I use is connected to a very small battery. You hold on to a bar. You touch a probe onto an acupuncture point which introduces electricity onto that meridian and you're finding out how much flows through that meridian. When you don't get enough to com that comes out on the other side, then you deem there, there's a blockage there. This is what some of the charting looked like. And so I had some low readings with some energetic drops, which meant that I have free radical pathology on some of those areas because it's stealing my electrons. And then I came up with some problems here. So she's got chronic pulpitis on tooth number three. And what's interesting is I went on the other side and checked tooth number 14, and tooth number 14 had a crazy reading as well, but tooth number three was the problem because it's on the same meridian. So you start to see how this all links together. And so what I did was send her back to her biological dentist and told her she needs neural therapy done on the area of tooth number three. And this was the first time this dentist had done that before. So she said, what is it I'm exactly I'm supposed to do? I said, you're just gonna take a little bleep of anesthetic and you're gonna place it in that area and you're gonna tell me what happens. Well, what happened was the patient started screaming, shut the front door, because her pain was gone just like that. So if you don't know what neural therapy is, you're going to believe that I am from Texas because I drive a pickup truck, big old red pickup truck. His name is Bart, big ass red truck. <laughs> Actually just got a new one and it's fancy, so my husband renamed it Fart, fancy ass red truck. <laughs> True story. Anyway, so if I go out to my truck and it won't start, I want a new truck. No, not my husband. He's thrifty. He's going to go out there and try to hotwire it, and bypass the starter. And if it works, then we know it's a bad starter. It's a very simplistic way of explaining to you what neural therapy is, but it lets you know if, there, if the, that particular area is the problem. And in this case, it was. So we just had her use some homeopathic remedies for a short time frame, and the pain went away. She didn't have to have a root canal done anywhere. This is the second case and the last one I have to show you. And this was a, a man named Buddy who was referred to me. I also do thermography in my office. And so thermography lets you look at where there's inflammation. And you can see that he has a lump right here. In the front of his neck and the anterior portion, you can see there's a lot of inflammation as well. But after I saw this, I said, hey, Buddy, can I take an x-ray? There's his panorex. And of course, if you look at the area 14 and 15, if, if the lights were dimmed, you'd be able to see this better. You'd see some pathology, a, a questionable area. So again, I use the equipment that I am familiar with using. There are other people who use muscle testing to see which of these was a problem. And here, this is a, a closer image of 14 and 15. And by the time I finished gathering my information, not only did I find out there was a problem here, but I found out there was a problem with some of his anterior teeth, especially down on the bottom. We went through here and found out, yes, here's heparin sulfate, which is usually found when there's an infection. So tooth number 14 was really the area that was of concern to help with this area in his neck. But I was finding a lot of problems with his kidney. So 
what I thought was interesting, well, he had the tooth taken out and the lump went away, but that was not the interesting thing to me. Buddy's been involved with the rodeo since he was four, and he's had nine kidney stones. Seems to happen every other year, and the last one this was the size of a cue ball. They had to do surgery on him. So I, uh, with looking at some of the stuff we were finding on the EAV and looking at that meridian and realizing those teeth were on there, it made me question that maybe he had had an awful lot of trauma to those teeth. Can you imagine what it's like to be on a bucking bronco and hit your teeth together that often? So what we did was put him on some homeopathic remedies, but the integrative side of me wanted to know what his uric acid was and his PTH because I can't just stop and look at teeth. I, I have to ask more questions. I hope this makes you start asking more questions about how the teeth are connected. And I recognize that not everybody's where I am as far as believing that the teeth are on those meridians and how much they're connected. I'm just asking you to be open-minded and start looking for yourself. And that's all I have to give you today. <laughs>